I've called my talk today a love story because I think it is the greatest love story of all time. It is mid-afternoon and my daughter came through the back door with her face buried in a notebook. Her first teaching prac is just complete. She looks up and she smiles. The advisor thinks I did very well, Mum, she says. Just a few tips for improvement. Are you all right still to go to Whale Beach? The door opens behind me. It's her brother coming out of his bedroom and suddenly the music is loud in the hallway. What's this about Whale Beach, Jack says. Can I drive? Jack is 16 and the only thing on his mind is getting his hours up so that he can go for his licence on his 17th birthday. OK, you can come, she says. Are you all right to go now, Mum? Or do you need a bit more time? I'm back at uni as well. No, it's OK, I say. We can go now. And I save my work and I close my laptop. I look at my daughter and I sigh. I want to take in this moment. It is a moment I have dreamed of since the day she was born. And after the events of the last few years, I can barely believe it is possible. We are going to Whale Beach to look at the little cottage that was many years ago, transformed into a restaurant. I haven't eaten there for ages, but my memory, if it serves me correctly, it tells me that it's perfectly quaint and suitably white for a wedding. As we head to the car, I decide to let Sam sit in the, in the passenger seat and help her brother navigate his way through the hairpin bends of Bilgola Plateau. We are still adjusting to life as a family, and it's been a long time since she's let anybody in her life except me. Cancer came quickly, and life slipped through our fingers like a tightly squeezed bar of wet soap, and we were hurled through time and space. We were struggling just to deal with the diagnosis. Even I hadn't noticed that my 14-year-old son had grown two feet taller, that he'd grown whiskers, that his voice had changed. The news that she was ill came as a complete surprise. She had been feisty, energetic and social throughout summer. I kind of ignored her when she said she was dizzy. Perhaps you should get an early night. Do a little bit less. Her dad said, you should get fit. You should join the gym. But when the dizzy sensations continued that last week of January, I did what every good mother would do. I took her for ear tests and eye tests and then eventually for blood tests. I thought maybe she's low in iron. But I wasn't concerned. My children are never sick. We had just had the most wonderful family holiday in Noosa. Even Sam's boyfriend Grant had come. Life was good. Emma had just finished her HSC and flown home early to open her results. We sat proudly looking for her name in the Sydney Morning Herald because she had made the honours roll. Driving along the headland, I opt to look out the window and think about our journey through cancer. Jack is remarkably capable as a driver. He has become incredibly independent over the last couple of years. Many patients who have leukaemia will require a bone marrow transplant to survive. So in the beginning, Sam had to give some blood, and so did her brother and her sister, to see if perhaps there was a sibling match. Only 33% of, of patients find a donor within their family. 
67% rely on an unrelated donor. We didn't let this bother us at first. That neither Sam's brother nor his sister were a match. Some patients do get through on chemotherapy alone, and we hoped that we would be amongst the lucky ones. That she would pull through. There was a test known as the Molecular Residual Disease Test, and that test would tell us whether she would need to have a bone marrow transplant, and we just believed that this would not be the case, that she would improve. I'll never forget the day those results arrived, when every hope that I'd clung to seemed to disappear. She was in the high-risk category, and the search for a donor became more intense. It became deliberate. We were told that we were lucky. Both my husband and I are Caucasian, and this gave Sam an 85% chance of finding a donor. People of ethnic background are not so lucky. Only 15% of ethnic people are on the registry worldwide. As we drive along the headland towards Whale Beach, I know we are amongst the lucky ones. We are returning to life. But the waiting was endless. It was not just the daily blood tests to see whether she'd need a transfusion. It was not just the monthly lumbar punctures that led to holes in her spine and leaking of cerebral fluid. It was not just looking at the screen where your daughter's sagging brain sits on the, on the top of her spine or trying to process what that would mean to her long term. It was not just all the tests that we didn't expect, the MRIs, the trips to X-ray, or the endless specialists that we needed to see, like when she lost her voice from one chemotherapy drug and was unable to speak for three months. There were endless complications. I walked the corridors of the hospital until I knew every secret passageway. I knew the whole labyrinth, and I could find a file better than any orderly. It was against the rules, but I managed to convince them that I knew where that file was, and I would get it for them. Because if I didn't get it, I knew she would not get the blood transfusion that she needed that day. I discovered in the corridors that I am the best advocate when it comes to my daughter's life. And it was then that I decided if a donor was ever found, if my daughter survived, then I would become an advocate for those who walked the corridors just like I did, willing their daughter to live. Worst of all was the fear that a donor might never be found. I watched. I knew. I saw them coming in, looking healthy, like my daughter had dancing with their drip poles in the corridors and laughing like they had all the time in the world, only to see them wheeled out on thin stretches under grey sheets and to see their name erased from the whiteboard. Their donor was never found 
and they died. We were amongst the lucky ones. And after eight months of waiting, a donor was found in America. We are a global society. And a gift from a stranger was sent all the way from the US to us here. A complete stranger donated his stem cells to save my daughter's life. There are so many myths about bone marrow transplants. It's not an operation. Here you can see this is Sam having her bone marrow transplant. It's a bag of blood going into her arm, and this is the easy part. Every day, just in Australia, 25 people are diagnosed with leukaemia or a similar blood-related disorder that will require a transplant. And like I said before, this is so important. People of mixed ethnicity have only 15% chance of finding a donor. And remember, I waited eight months. I, it was my daughter that waited, but honestly, it felt like it was me. And yet, it is so easy to donate stem cells. Anyone between the ages of 18 and 40 in Australia, overseas, you can be 60, so we, need, we could fight that battle later. But anyone between the ages of 18 and 40 in Australia can go on the Australian Bone Marrow Donor Registry. It costs nothing in our nation to donate. All around the world, people are waiting for donors in the hope of finding a match, just like my daughter. Indicating your ethnic group when you fill out the form is really important to helping us help you find a match for a patient. People say, how does it work? Nobody knows, do they? They take a small sample of blood in the first instance, like two tablespoons, two teaspoons, I believe, two teaspoons of blood, and then you are entered into a worldwide registry to see if there is a patient somewhere in the world with the same DNA match as you. When a match is found, they will take some more blood just to make sure that it is correct, that, it is, that this is right, and confirm the match. Okay, so you're terrified. You think that this is going to be one of the worst things that could have ever happened to you? No. Only one in ten bone marrow donations are taken from the hip. And for you as the donor, that is done under a general anaesthetic. It's the patient who suffers during a bone marrow biopsy, not the donor who donates the stem cells. But in fact, nine out of ten donations are done peripherally through the blood in your arm. The blood is centrifuged, the stem cells extracted, and the rest of your blood is returned to your body at the same time. People say they feel a little bit queasy, but they go back to work the next day. You know, there was a time when it was so touch and go, and we didn't think that Sam would make it. As we pulled into the car park at Whale Beach, I noticed that it was serenely silent. There was just one fisherman on the beach. And the restaurant, it was closed. So we hopped out of the car anyway. And we looked through the windows and we cupped our hands so that we could see what was going on inside. They were renovating. There was a painter painting the ceiling. And it reminded me of how much our own life has been restored. And then Sam begins to describe the way it will be. And as she talks, I can hear the music. I can see her laughing. I can see her cutting her cake. How many times driving to hospital Waiting for treatments, did we talk about her wedding? It was the very thing that seemed to keep her alive. And thanks to the hope and faith and the kindness of a stranger, that day we were closer than I ever imagined that we could be. You have the power 
to save someone's life. Now my daughter is engaged. She's nearly finished her teaching degree. She's following in my footsteps. And she's getting married in December. They are engaged. We can make a change, people. It needs to change. You are desperately needed on the Global Registry. As I stood looking in those windows, I took one moment to remember all the friends we made in the hospital and all the ones we lost because a donor was never found. And I take time to feel thankful to the man who donated his stem cells so that my daughter could plan to live happily ever after. She's here. Why don't you just stand up, hey? <laughs> <laughs>